Disputable tactical and strategic decisions resulted from General Joseph Stilwell's withholding of intelligence data on Japanese unit strength at Maikina. Colonel Joseph Thelview, on May 17, 1944, in a coup d'etat, Vinegar Joe Stilwell and his Sino-American Maikina Task Force, MTF, took control of the crucial airfield under Japanese control. Located near the town of Maikina on the vast Irrawaddy River in northern Burma, Stilwell's American 5307th Composite Unit, provisional, codenamed Galahad, but also referred to in the press as Merrill's Marauders, comprised the MTF, together with parts of his two Chinese battalions that he had trained at Rangar, India, and Kashin scouts headed by the Office of Strategic Services, OSS. The brilliant military operation, which first crossed the Kuman Range and then the Hukong and Mogong Valleys in Burma, was not complete, though, as the heavily fortified town of Maikina itself was not taken until August 3, following a terrible and lengthy 78-day siege. A few of Stilwell's most important American aides in the multinational force claimed that incorrect, recurring assessments of the Japanese garrison's power resulted in subpar tactical and strategic judgments that required the protracted siege. Jeffrey Perret, a modern historian, claims that Stilwell's main goal was the airfield. He intended to seize it, bring in Chinese forces by air, and then take control of the nearby town. This was wholly his own idea. No one asked his chief of staff, Brigadier General Hayden Boatner, what he thought of it. Only Merrill and his own son, whom he had designated as his G2, were present when he discussed it. There were just a few hundred Japanese remaining in Maikina, Colonel Joseph Stillwell Jr. told his father, too few to hold the town and too few to protect the airstrip. It is true that the Japanese fighters stationed there posed a threat to the Air Transport Command, ATC, pilots, preventing them from using the less taxing and more southerly hump route from India to China, which avoided the geographically dangerous northerly flight path over the Himalayan peaks. However, the airfield was captured on May 17, and the threat posed by the fighters was eliminated. But in order to complete the Lido Road's intersection with the Burma Road and create a location where land connectivity could be restored with China via an all-weather road and an oil pipeline, Maikina Town had to be taken. Long after the conflict, in a biting military remark, U.S. inexplicably, in a display of gross military incompetence, Stilwell completely failed to take advantage of this coup de main Army Colonel Scott McMichael wrote, Rather than transporting robust infantry reinforcements, provisions, and ammunition by air, Stilwell's team utilized anti-aircraft units and personnel to create airfields. Consequently, a fantastic chance was missed. No one has ever provided a satisfactory explanation for Stilwell's mental breakdown which gave the Japanese the opportunity to fortify the Maikina garrison to the point where it could only be captured by storm after a three-month siege. One of Stilwell's biggest humiliations was his inability to capture the town of Maikina following his first spectacular victory at seizing the Western Airport. Ironically, Stilwell was an intelligence officer in the First World War, serving as chief intelligence officer with the Ivy Army Corps. American Expeditionary Force, and an intelligence liaison with the French Army at Verdun. He received his training at the Army General Staff College in Langres, France. In the interim between the wars, he served as the first U.S. language officer for China with the Army Intelligence Division. He was promoted to major and departed for Peking in August 1919. Chinese-speaking Major Stilwell was dispatched into the countryside in 1926, as civil unrest between Chinese communists, competing warlords, and Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist forces was intensifying in order to obtain first-hand intelligence about the scope of the disturbances. Stilwell's life was frequently threatened during the risky intelligence mission because he was a foreigner, 
but his thoroughness of report writing won him praise and he was soon on his way to being the united states leading military expert on china unusually for a west point graduate Silwell had a strong streak of unconventionality when directing the northern combat area command ncac in burma in 1943 to 1944 he put his son and sons-in-law on his staff since he felt so strongly about family ties he liked to keep a surrogate family of a few trusted friends near him according to historian shelford bidwell the family was Silwell's main source of support throughout his life as his biographer barbara touchman observed Stillwell had sent for his son joe jr then a lieutenant colonel who arrived in november nineteen forty two to serve as g two as well as his sons-in-law colonel ernest easterbrook and major ellis cox who came to join the rangar staff serving as liaison officers with the chinese divisions boatner stated on or around april twenty five nineteen forty four i went back to n c a c headquarters at that time both easterbrook and cox were working there at shaduza alongside j galgas general stillwell the former a very outstanding man and officer assisted j d o s at headquarters and cox worked in little joe's g two division neither ever exploited familial ties or did anything beyond from their assigned tasks though on rare occasions u s it is generally seen as improper behavior for army generals to have their sons and other family members serve directly under them like his father little joe was erratic and impetuous and he would engage in extracurricular activities both deliberately and unintentionally many people were not fond of the erratic and nepotistical direction of operations in the n c a c as noted mockingly by colonel charles hunter who served as galahad's deputy commander at first led eight force in the capture of the mikina airfield and ultimately served as the overall commander of american ground forces under stillwell at mikina although stillwell's prior end runs with galahad at wallavum shaduza and in Kangatom achieved their immediate goals the results of the follow-up were disappointing partly due to deficiencies in theater intelligence the attack on mike Kina, according to hunter was seized with sensationally neat precision but what should have been the following quick occupation of the town was turned into a grueling ten-week siege by lack of planning international and inter-service involvements and the manipulation of intelligence was the japanese strength of intelligence at mikey in a town purposefully understated and if so why did the japanese soldier strength estimates turn out to be untrustworthy which would have made the seizure of the town take longer lastly did general stillwell's judgment be clouded by the low number of japanese forces he and his g two staff believed to be in mike kina preventing him from using veteran british troops assigned to support his attack on mike kina hunter's post-war memoirs and other writings state that merrill was informed upon arriving at the mike kina airfield on may nineteenth that on the day of the airfield's capture may seventeen local intelligence from galahad troops and cash and scouts had placed between four hundred and five hundred japanese in mike kina however rapid reinforcement caused the town's garrison to quickly swell to over two thousand troops or two and a half battalions it was also expected that reinforcements from other japanese divisions would move southward toward mikina merrill went to general stillwell's headquarters at shaduzup on the kamang road between walabum and Inkangatong which were all the locations of earlier galahad operations prior to the mikina assault with hunter's estimations of a fast-growing japanese garrison size at mike kina colonel stillwell the g two officer and the intelligence staff at the mtf headquarters which hunter mentioned was at this time inexplicably back at nava both lowered these figures back to four hundred to five hundred on may one galahad's first and third battalions left from the settlement of nava which is located on the tanang river just west of the kuman range to begin their march to mike kina 
General Merrill had what amounted to a divisional headquarters at Nabum, which was to be kept back until the airfield, was reached rather than marching to Maikina with the attacking Galahad and Chinese soldiers. Even if more Japanese were killed in action at the airfield and in the town's surroundings during the following days of exhausting fighting, the estimate of 400 to 500 Japanese in Maikina would not be changed. Hunter was so offended by the disparity between the real numbers discovered on the battlefield and the intelligence estimates held by the senior NTF headquarters at Nabum that he claimed, post-war, that the low enemy estimates were intended to deceive the Chinese troops into a sense of shame in view of their demonstrated lack of aggressiveness. Galahad and the Chinese were not fooled by this information. I personally believe in the idea of purposeful deception. Colonel Stilwell, the son of Stilwell, could not have been more ignorant of the situation than the intelligence estimates provided to Galahad in June and July. If he had been, he should have been relieved. This intentional manipulation of intelligence created a total lack of confidence in the estimates of enemy strength from higher headquarters, to the point where they were typically discarded upon receipt. The Japanese unit identifications written on the deceased soldier's pants were discovered by Galahad's battlemen. The MTF headquarters at Shaduza and later at the airfield, along with Stilwell, had grown so steadfastly, devoted to the estimate of 400 to 500 Japanese troops in Maikina that attempts to reassess this estimate in light of the number of Japanese soldiers known to have been killed in and around Maikina were disregarded. Furthermore, Galahad started to apprehend and question some 50 Japanese soldiers from Maikina's fortifications after a few weeks of taking control of the airfield. As Hunter angrily observed, our positive unit identifications and casualty counts were brushed aside. Hunter and others realized that there were around 2,000 Japanese combatants in the village of Maikina after learning information from the Japanese detainees. According to later Japanese estimates, there were 4,500 Japanese soldiers in Mekina at one point during the siege. Even Galahad's estimate of over 2,000 enemy soldiers at Mekina, as Hunter explained after the war, was way short of the correct figure, as we learned after the war from Japanese officers, for a very simple reason. The name and unit of every Japanese soldier we had so far killed or captured were written in India ink on the inside of their breeches. We started finding carcasses without this marking in June, so we were unable to determine if they belonged to newly discovered units or ones that had already been identified. Because of this, our estimate, which was based on the known organizational strength of positively identifiable units, was insufficient, and we were unaware that the enemy had 4,500 troops opposing us at one point during the battle. In his memoirs, Boatner writes, What strikes me most is that I never seem to have doubted the estimate that we had enough attacking strength to take the town, and that there was not much more than the 600 to 700 Japanese that J. Gov. U.S. General Stilwell told me were in the town. However, the Japanese officers' interrogations produced several extremely important statements. In addition to categorically contradicting Colonel Stilwell's estimates of 400 to 500 enemy troops in Maikina, these post-war Japanese admissions put the Japanese military strength between 3,500 and 4,600 men. Furthermore, in May, the Japanese chose to let the 18th Division, consisting of just two regiments, to retain Kamang, the Japanese had chosen to reinforce Mogong and Maikina with components of the 53rd Division, and the Division's 114th Regiment was stationed in Maikina. Lastly, in June alone, there were at least 1,000 Japanese casualties in Maikina. The 4,400 Japs in Maikina explains the delay and extra casualties. Boatner speculated in his archives. Galahad did everything in his could to blockade the main ways to Maikina during the final 10 days of May, but the Japanese managed to reinforce the garrison with between 3,000 and 4,000 troops from the Nsapsup, Mogong, 
and even the Bamum districts. After a week of capturing the airstrip, the Japanese were able to go on the offensive and attack the MTF there because they had gathered more forces at Mite Kiena than the Allies had. General Honda felt that the 18th Division was stronger and had better morale than he had expected. Boltner wrote after his inspection of the division on May 27. Consequently, he made the decision to cover the 18th Division at Kamang instead of using the 53rd Division to relieve Mike Kiena. General Honda never wavered in his opinion that the last resort should be Mike Kiena. Thus, it was unquestionably determined to deploy the 53rd Division to protect and relieve Mike Kiena. Nearly a week after, the village of Mitkina was taken. On August 9th, a G2 MTF memorandum estimated that 4,075 Japanese were killed in Mitkina. These numbers, along with the several hundred who managed to flee, were rather near to Tanaka's 4,600. When considering Tanaka's figure as the grand total, it can be reconciled with the above. Mariyama, the garrison commander, put his strength at 3,500. I will probably have to use some of our engineer units to keep an American flavor in the fight. Still will cable General Marshall, his boss. There is debate, therefore, over why the British 36th Division was not used to capture Mitkina following the airfield seizure in mid-May. Instead, Stillwell ordered the division south in July 1944 to the railway corridor, which stretched 145 miles from Mike Kiena in the north to Katha on the Irrawaddy in the south. Jeffrey Foster, the division's historian, states that the 36th Division was the first all-British formation to serve under General Joseph Stillwell. For a moment, Stillwell contemplated calling for the British 36th Division to be hurried in to capture Mike Kiena. These British veterans were primed for action and the obvious force to relieve Hunter's weary soldiers. The 36th Division had been pulled out of Arakan to rehabilitate before being assigned to Stillwell's NCAC. An American-led Chinese artillery group with three batteries was attached to the 36th Division, while the 10th U.S. Army Air Force provided a separate air contingent. A U.S. engineering company also joined the 36th Division to construct aviation landing strips for wounded personnel evacuation and resupply. The MTF would have greatly benefited from this force's accompanying artillery and support forces in the early stages of its siege of Mike Kena Town. Rather, Hunter had to get the engineers trained rapidly so they could take on the seasoned Japanese soldiers in combat. Possibly due to his Anglophobia, Stillwell did not want to rely on British troops to give his Sino-American forces more inland in their dying push on Mike Kena Town. Had the actual might of the Japanese garrison at Mike Kina been widely recognized among the various Allied headquarters, Stillwell might have been forced to swallow his pride and use this force in order to secure the prize of Mike Kina more quickly. As the hub for essential road, river, and rail connections between the southwestern Chinese provinces and the remainder of Burma, Mike Kina's early capture would have conferred strategic benefits as a possible supply center to which the Allied Combined Chiefs of Staff, CCS, and the American Joint Chiefs of Staff, JCS, had placed such a high value for operations to come. 